everybody. I uh, hope you're doing well today. Uh, welcome to part two of the spring 2022 faculty development conference keynote event, as I've been calling it. Uh, I am Dr. Allison Boyer, Director of the Center for Teaching and Learning here at Collin College, and I am beyond thrilled to be here live with our keynote speaker, Dr. Pooja Agarwal, for what I know is going to be a really great discussion that will expound on some of the things that she talked about in part one of her keynote presentation. Uh, and if you haven't watched that yet, I strongly encourage you to do so. It is fantastic. And you can watch it in your pajamas at home if you want to, which is even better. Um, for those of you who missed my introduction uh, during last week's in-person uh, watch party of her recorded presentation, I just want to share a little bit with you about Dr. Agarwal. Uh, she is a cognitive scientist uh, who has conducted research on how students learn since 2005. As you know, she is author of the book, Powerful Teaching, Unleash the Science of Learning, and an assistant professor of psychology at Berkeley College of Music in Boston, teaching psychological science to some exceptional undergraduate musicians, which sounds truly amazing. Uh, she is also the founder of retrievalpractice.org, a source of research-based teaching strategies for more than 15,000 teachers around the world. Um, and as uh, hopefully you all know, she uh, created a specialized individualized link on her on her web page specifically for us here at Colin. Um, she has put the link in the chat. I'll put it in the chat again for you as well. It's also in the electronic copy of the conference program that I posted on the CTL website and sent out to all of you. So please take a look at it. It has some really fabulous resources. Um, a little bit more about Dr. Agarwal. Uh, her research has been published in leading journals, highlighted by the New York Times, NPR, Scientific American, and Education Week, and recognized by the National Science Foundation. Her love of learning formed at the outset of her career as a fourth and fifth grade teacher in St. Louis, Missouri. She received her PhD from Washington University in St. Louis, under the mentorship of distinguished memory scholar and author of the book, Make It Stick, Henry Rodiger III. So here's our plan for the next 45 minutes or so. We are going to begin our conversation with the questions that were submitted in advance. So thank you to all of you who uh, submitted those really wonderful questions. And we'll do our best to get to all of them, um, but really start by focusing on the ones that I think were broadest in scope. And as time allows, we will leave a few minutes at the end of our time together for those of you who are here today to pose any additional questions that you might have. Um, and if you do have questions along the way, please just pop them into the chat here. Um, I'm going to be monitoring that for Dr. Agarwal as, um, as we have our discussion today. So without further ado, uh, what do you say we get this conversation started? Sound good? All right. So um, one, the, I think the question that I would like to start with today, Dr. Agarwal, is one that I, um, I heard several people discussing as we were watching the, your presentation together at our in-person event last week. And I think is honestly a question that I think is um, a tale as old as time. And that is, uh, do you have any suggestions for engaging those unwilling students uh, in the strategies that you discuss specifically. Um, you know, all too often our students are not as motivated to participate as we would like them to be and are perhaps more motivated by grades and are reluctant to do some things, um, even really small activities or quick questions, unless there's a grade attached to it. Um, and something I think that's good to keep in mind is we also have a very different population of students here at Collin than you do at your um, elite music school in Boston. <laughs> so um, do you have any suggestions or ideas that you might um, offer to our faculty here about engagement? 
Thank you for that question. Um, I wanted to say thank you to all of you for being here today and for watching the keynote. Um, and a big thank you to you, Dr. Boyer, for putting all of this together behind the scenes and making this happen. Uh, I am so thrilled to be here and to share the science of learning and to talk about the research and my teaching as well. Um, so to the first question, what about unwilling students? Some of my students are motivated by grades and some of them aren't. So I sort of have a mix. And I was thinking about maybe at least two approaches. And I encourage anyone and everyone to type your thoughts into the chat um, as well. Two approaches I was thinking of is one, during class, when we provide activities, students are kind of a captive audience. <laughs> so we that is our opportunity in the classroom to really have a say and, and control what's going on. And so within our own classrooms, taking that minute that I talked about to simply ask students, what's one thing you learned? What do you remember from our last class? How does this topic relate to another topic? And that could be a think pair share. I talked about not skipping the think step. Um, that could be a writing prompt. That could be a Padlet, Google form, et cetera. So I think in person, we have that opportunity even for grade motivated students. The second thought that comes to mind outside of the classroom, of course, we can't make sure what students are doing outside of the classroom. If you already have graded assignments, whether they're quizzes, midterms, finals, exams, projects, because those are graded, that's another opportunity for retrieval practice that students are going to complete. And so you don't have to add points, but maybe even just to that quiz or that exam, add one retrieval question. Give me an example of this concept in your own life. Um, that way students can't Google examples <laughs> related to their own life. Or add a simple question, what's something else you've learned that I didn't ask you about on this test or quiz? And so that way students are completing the graded assignments, if that's their motivation, we as the faculty can still add one extra retrieval prompt or even more than that. But I think just adding one question is the lowest hanging fruit. And again, that way you, you're encouraging students to retrieve in the classroom, even if it's not for a grade, and outside of the classroom on assignments that are graded. Thank you. Um, I, that's a really fun idea. I like that idea of adding a little bit extra to an exam that they have to take anyway, but that will benefit them in other ways as well. That's, that's a really great idea. Um, so my next question, it might be something that you get a lot. And um, when you say, when you, when you, when you told us during your presentation, um, ask yourself, why are you giving midterms? Why are you giving finals? I imagine for a lot of faculty members, that's kind of a like, oh, you know, that <laughs> that's at the core of our being, right, as, as college faculty. So I, I think another question that, that popped up a few times was, um, so if you're not giving those traditional midterms and finals, you know, those big kind of high stakes things, um, how do you implement more formal assessments in your own courses? How, you know, how do you determine grades in your classes? I love talking about grades <laughs> <laughs> um, because it's something we all think about so much. It can be the core around which we assess students, we assess their learning. It can drive that motivation piece for sure. Um, and one of the main ways that I grade students without a midterm or a final, without any high stakes assignments, is that students have smaller assignments every single week. And each of my assignments every week are about 2% of their grade. So for example, every week students have a retrieval practice or a mini quiz over Google Forms which works well in person, works well for remote learning, they complete a Google form 24 hours before class. That way I can see what they're retrieving. I can see if there are any misunderstandings. Retrieval practice can be formative assessment for us. 
and it's low stakes. So those mini quizzes on Google Forms are only 2% each. And we have a 15 week semester and I don't have these mini quizzes on the first day and, you know, not for President's Day or Thanksgiving break or spring break. So usually there are about 13 total. And because of that, the lowest three grades are dropped. So it just makes for a perfect round number of 10 mini quizzes worth 2% of their grade each. So students have this comfort zone of it's low stakes retrieval. I don't, they're, they're less tempted to cheat. They're retrieving every week. They're spacing information out. And if they're absent, they didn't do the reading, they need to sleep. For any reason, my grading platform on Moodle just literally drops the automatic lowest three grades. So that's kind of a, a third um, of students' grades. A third of students' grades are individual projects. My students have to read a research article in psychology. And then I had mentioned briefly Flipgrid, where students have to record videos throughout the semester on Flipgrid. So that's about a third, but a third of the total pot of grades. But again, because they do Flipgrids almost every week, they're low stakes. And then the, the remaining third of my grading is some kind of project. And this has sort of morphed for me during the pandemic, during remote learning. So I'm still trying to figure that out and what it looks like this semester and going forward. But in general, those used to be group projects where students had to complete assignments along the way. It wasn't like a big group project with a presentation at the end. And that way it avoids slackers as well. <laughs> Students can work on their weekly group assignments on Zoom and breakouts in person. So that's a third. Um, I will say I used to grade participation and attendance, and during the pandemic, I've chosen not to. I highly recommend the resources and articles by James Lang. Um, his, one of his earliest books on course talks a lot about grading, and I revisit that every semester. And he has an article in the Chronicle of Higher Ed that came out I don't know, last semester maybe, about why you shouldn't grade participation, especially during the pandemic. So long story short, instead of two high stakes assignments, students have assignments every week. I do recognize that that takes a little more time to keep up with my students. At the same time, I can skim those Google Forms pretty easily. I can watch those flip grids on double speed. So I don't have the crunch of a ton of grading mid-semester and at the end of the semester. Once the semester ends, I'm like ready to go on break because I've been grading throughout the semester too. And I, I think uh, that is perhaps a perfect segue to another question, I think you're already anticipating uh, the big question that I think a lot of people have, and that is that question about um, time management, right? Uh, one of uh, the questions that came in was specifically about the, the feedback process itself. Um, and thinking about the things that you just described, uh, that is, a, that's a lot of work, right? Um, so how, how do students get useful feedback from their instructors regarding all of these retrieval exercises and all of these little mini assignments? Um, do you, you know, besides, you know, doing quick things like the Google Forms or watching the, the quick Flipgrid videos, do you have any other suggestions for preventing specifically that feedback process from becoming too time consuming? Thanks for asking. Of course, I don't want to grade more. <laughs> that is not something any of us are interested in doing. I have 80 students. I don't want to spend more time grading. Um, the Google Forms have a feedback um, tool or a feedback option. What you do is you go to the settings and make the Google Form a quiz. There's like a little toggle, make, make this a quiz or make a quiz. And you don't have to grade it. You can set it where it's not graded, but then you can add in written feedback so that once a student submits the Google form, they can click on a link that says, check your accuracy. When they click on that, then they can see, oh, here's Dr. Agarwal's explanation for what stereotype threat is, 
or, oh, after this question she asked about neuroscience, I can insert a link to a YouTube video with more information. And that way students are receiving feedback, but I don't have to grade every individual mini quiz in quite the same way. And again, I can skim and get a sense if students are getting things correct or incorrect as well. But I like the feedback uh, feature on Google Forms. It does take some time and planning to do that in advance. Um, whether you plan and do that and get your ducks in a row before the semester, or for me, sometimes I'm tweaking that feedback the day before I send students that Google form. Um, so that's one way where students get feedback. It's not individualized, but it's quick and easy for us. On Flipgrid, my students get feedback from each other. My students have to reply and comment at, to at least one other student. And there's research showing that peer feedback can improve student learning. So I do respond to Flipgrid in the written Moodle platform instead of on Flipgrid, because logistically I've learned it's faster to me to copy and paste some feedback <laughs> instead of individually posting a video for every student. The third thing I think I mentioned in my keynote is we can give ourselves permission to not grade at all. We do not have to grade these retrieval activities at all. So especially the activities in class, if it's a quick writing prompt or discussion prompt, there's no extra grading. And even if it's outside of class, again, let's say you already have a quiz set up, you just add one additional question. Maybe you just choose to not grade that question. That's like so unheard of, I think. Wait, there's a question on a quiz that's ungraded, but students still have to complete the quiz, so they still get their grade. Uh, and then you could give students feedback as part of a discussion in class. So I do recognize, wow, these weekly assignments sound like a lot. This retrieval sounds like a lot. At the same time, we don't have to grade it all or any of it. The purpose is a learning strategy, not just an assessment strategy. And we can set up some systems to grade in advance to provide students with feedback. So thank you for asking that. I know that's a big concern. Um, and as Dr. Boyer mentioned uh, in my book, Powerful Teaching, I have a whole chapter <laughs> on grading and assessment and the distinction between retrieval, formative, and summative assessment as well. Uh, and that makes me think of something that you said in your recorded presentation, and that is, that um, retrieval practice, like you just said now, is not assessment. It doesn't have to be assessment, right? That it's just the very act of our students going through the process of trying to remember something that's beneficial. So there may not, so maybe there doesn't need to be feedback. There doesn't need to be a grade, right? Um, we do know from additional research that any retrieval is great. So mm -hmm. retrieval practice, with feedback, awesome. Retrieval practice, even without feedback, this is a little counterintuitive, but retrieval practice, even without feedback, improves students' learning beyond that kind of encoding or cramming or getting information in. The simple act of retrieval, even without feedback, benefits students. Thank you. Uh, and I have more information. I'll put the link in the chat. If you just go to retrievalpractice.org slash feedback, that's where I have more resources about feedback strategies. You can download a free guide about feedback and metacognition that I mentioned in my keynote as well. So there's a direct link. Thank you. Um, you typed that really fast into the chat. <laughs> I'm multi-failing sometimes. It's amazing. I didn't mention this in the keynote, but uh, humans can't multitask. What we do is multi-fail. Um, so even, oh gosh, I hope some of you aren't listening while driving because that's extremely dangerous and I can send you the research on this. Um, but yes, I will admit if I type in the chat, I'm multi-failing for a split second. It's impressive nonetheless. Um, so another really good question that I imagine a lot of people have um, is, again, I think another kind of age-old question about covering the content, right? Uh, so there are faculty who teach some more of what I might call content-dense courses. So, you know, STEM discipline courses like microbiology and things like that, um, that require this kind of fundamental knowledge of some essential facts 
in order to solve some more in-depth questions. Um, so students often are focusing really on that cramming activity and memorizing the facts, right? Um, and frequently struggling with that. That's not an easy thing to do. Um, and as you have taught us, it's not the best way to learn, but it's, it's something that they do. And they might never even consider how to use those facts that they've crammed into their brains in order to solve a deeper problem. So do you have any additional advice on how to first help students manage the retrieval of such dense and honestly often overwhelming amounts of information, but also help instructors free up time in class to practice those activities. I'm sure, as you know, it can be really challenging for instructors to let go of that urge um, to quote unquote, cover everything in class. Yeah, yeah, I love this question, um, in part because I think this is something we're, we're all so used to. We have this content we have to get through, we have to cover. And I wonder if, something counterintuitive is that retrieval practice saves you time. So especially at the outset, it may seem like this one minute prompt during class, wow, that's one minute when I could have covered a lot more content. I would hope that you would try out, challenge yourself to even swap one minute of your lecture with a quick question of what did you learn today? Um, and because students are retrieving more, especially in class, because again, that's what we can control more of, if students are retrieving more in class, they will remember more. And then we don't have to have those review sessions. <laughs> we don't have to keep reviewing content. We don't have to keep reteaching. I'm sure a lot of us have had the experience of like, well, I just taught you that concept last semester. What? but you don't remember it, now I have to reteach it all over again. So if students are retrieving frequently, they'll remember more. And because they remember more, you can move on to newer content. Think about how much time we spend reteaching the same thing to students who just learn it and then they forget it, right? So I can see how in the short term, retrieval sounds like it could take a lot of classroom time. And I hope you feel I've provided some strategies where it takes one minute or less. And in the long term, you'll be able to actually cover more content in a sense of, of more novel or more advanced content because you're not reteaching earlier concepts. Um, so I, I, I think that answered both of your questions. Yeah, great. Thank you. Sure. Um, so our next question is perhaps more specific um, to the online classroom. So this is coming straight from an instructor who teaches online. Um, and she noted that probably not surprising, many students would rather Google search than struggle with recall um, on their own, which obviously defeats the purpose of retrieval practice. Um, so what tips or examples of retrieval practices can you share um, about exercises that are quick, easy to grade, like we've already been talking about, and that might um, prevent students from being tempted to just Google something instead of using their own memory? Yes, I have, of course, this sort of situation with my own students. Um, there has been more and more research out there, and a friend of mine has published a book, Jason Finley on Memory and Technology, about this interplay between Google and memory. Um, but on a day-to-day -day basis, my students want to Google things too. So here's the way I get around it. In class, if you ask something like, what's one thing you learned today? Students can't Google that. <laughs> they were in class in the moment, so that's not even a Googleable question. Outside of class, like on my mini quiz Google forms, I pretty much stick to asking students for examples. So you learned about stereotype threat, um, where if, for example, um, if girls are told that they're bad at math, they do worse on a test than if they weren't told that at all. So that's stereotype threat. So I might ask a student, we talked about stereotype threat. 
Give me an example related to music. So maybe they Google stereotype threat to remind themselves what that was, but then I've asked not just give me an example from your own life, but give me an example specific to music or give me an example specific to the winter time or give me an example specific to squid games on Netflix, right? Because then when you give someone a specific context, they really can't Google that answer. And from my own research, I've shown that that additional push to kind of come up with an example, as opposed to just tell me what stereotype threat is, asking for an example improves students' higher order learning. They're then able to transfer that concept to new situations, to other ideas as well. So in that way, really think about how you can ask the questions in a way that's not Googleable. And I think the easiest is to ask for everyday examples. To come back, because we're asking students for examples, that's also not the easiest for us to grade because it's not Googleable, because it's not a definition. At the same time, I'm sure we all do this. I can kind of skim and get a sense of students got it or they don't. Um, I do also on my Google form specify that students have to give me about two to three sentences for every question, which to me makes it easier to see, do they actually think through this example or is this just not really hitting it on the head? Um, I will say kind of related to students wanting to Google, it's also very easy to copy and paste, at least for me, my 80 students responses in a Google form, I copy and paste it into Turnitin, that's the service we use, and run a quick um, test for plagiarism. So if that's another concern about Google Forms, um, you can just copy and paste it to most uh, sort of plagiarism software. Thank you. That was very helpful. Um, another question uh, that we have relates to, I think, this point that you made in your presentation that forgetting is good. And that is, um, maybe you could talk a little, could you talk a little bit more about how to leverage <laughs> that forgetting, right, um, to help students strengthen their, their uh, memory retention and cut down on that cramming? How can we uh, help them leverage that forgetting to their benefit? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, um, it takes some time because we ourselves, even in school, when we were students have been taught that forgetting is a bad thing. That's the opposite of learning. We don't wanna do that. <laughs> and as I mentioned, as you said, that forgetting is a good thing for learning. Um, be because we forget, then retrieving is that added mental struggle, a desirable difficulty. One of the first ways I help normalize forgetting and encourage students to think about forgetting as a good thing for learning is to talk about it. And I just say in class, you know, we start off by talking about how students study. Most of them say they cram. Then I ask them, you know, where'd you pick up on that? And they say, uh, they just learn it over time. You know, they rarely say where they learned how to cram, but they all cram. And then I ask students, does it work? And students recognize that cramming improves learning in the short term. They might ace an exam, but it doesn't work in the long term. They forget everything. And that's frustrating for our students too, right? And so when we talk about forgetting in my classrooms, I tell students that's the way memory works. We also forget that's the way humans work. No one remembers everything. I don't remember what I did on my birthday two years ago. I barely remember my coursework from college. <laughs> that's how it works and that's okay. That will improve your learning to not cram. When you're cramming, you're preventing forgetting. And so I have open conversations with students about how they study and how they feel about forgetting. Uh, we talk about some examples where forgetting is no big deal. So I don't remember my birthday from two years ago. I guess I could Google it, you know, look at my photos, um, but that's okay that I forgot that. And I talked to my students about how I don't expect them to remember every concept they learn in 15 weeks in my class. If they remember one thing a week, 
I'm happy with that. And so we talk about what are the key things I want you to remember. It's okay if you forget, let's engage in these weekly assignments and let's circle back. How does it feel to retreat? How does it feel to forget? So it can seem a little, um, I don't know, fluffy, <laughs> squishy, but really just acknowledging that forgetting is what happens and acknowledging that forgetting is good for learning gives at least my students like a sigh of relief. They have walked into a classroom where learning isn't perfect. They have walked into a classroom where forgetting is totally fine. So another example is, um, let's say, uh, you know, I, I am always working on my Spanish. Maybe you speak a foreign language or you're taking classes. Pre-pandemic, I was traveling a lot, using my Spanish. During the pandemic, I've forgotten a lot about it. After the pandemic, I'm going to be retreating it again, and it's going to come back even faster. You've probably had this experience with exercise um, or, you know, strength training. You've had this experience. People talk a lot about riding a bike. It feels like just riding a bike because that forgetting is okay, and it'll come back around. So my students and I also talk about situations in which forgetting is okay. It's okay if I've forgotten my Spanish. I'll pick up on it again, you know, the next time I travel. Thank you. Um, I love framing forgetting as a desirable difficulty. I think that makes a lot of sense. And like you said, just um, letting students know that it's okay to not be perfect and that it's okay to go through these difficulties uh, can be really empowering, I think, to them. I guess something I'll add, especially in the context of the question earlier about grading, of course, our grades reinforce the idea that thou shalt remember, <laughs> right? <laughs> Students don't want to forget when they're taking a midterm or a final. That's why they cram. They don't want to forget on practice problems or labs or quizzes. And so I tell students that I don't, I mean, I kind of give partial credit, but even on my mini quizzes or, or sometimes on Flipgrid, depending on the context, I tell students, it's okay if you forget, you could still get full points. Let's say you get like, you know, 90% of the questions, meaning not accurate, but like you've answered the questions, you've done a good job, you seem to have demonstrated or made an attempt at taking a class concept and applying it in your own life. If you just can't remember the answer to a question, just type or write, I don't remember. And that's okay. And students are like, wait, I can do that? Yes, yes, you can. <laughs> just tell me, I forgot. Maybe next week. And that helps take that stigma away as well. Nice. Um, so I think we have some time here to maybe talk about some of the more nitty gritty uh, details that you mentioned. Uh, you've, you've already talked a lot about how you use Google Forms, so uh, we might come back to that, but I did have a few questions about Flipgrid, um, which has been around for a little while, but it's not something that necessarily a lot of faculty know about. So um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about how you use Flipgrid. Do you have any um, suggestions for best practices in using Flipgrid, and um, are there technical things to watch out for, how do students respond to it, all of that kind of good stuff. Um, thanks. Uh, like I mentioned, Flipgrid is one of my favorite tech tools. And if I have a moment in multi-fail, I can pull up a link so that um, people can watch uh, examples. If you go to my website, retrievalpractice.org, and if you type in flash forward, I think, uh, if someone wants to do that and type it into the chat, that link, then you can watch examples from it. my classes. Okay, thanks. Um, so Flipgrid is this free tech tool for students where they post videos, quick selfie videos. They could be walking in class. They could be in the comfort of their own home. Maybe they're on campus with masks on. Um, and it's a lot more engaging to watch someone on video than it is to just read these Canvas or Blackboard or Moodle discussion boards, I think. Um, students uh, are a little nervous about these selfie videos at the beginning of the semester, but by the end, I would say 90% of my students report loving it. 
Um, they, I really encourage, and I model for them. I'm a big fan of modeling in general. I model for them adding stickers and filters and making it silly and making it super quick and making my Flipgrid videos seem really informal because that helps set the classroom norm of this is really fun. So I do that. I model with posting my own Flipgrid videos. So actually, um, my classes start on Tuesday as well. <laughs> so I have set up Flipgrids for my classes, and I currently have an intro topic that just says, introduce yourself. And I ask students for their name, their pronouns, um, and their favorite TV show, Netflix, TV, Hulu. And I have already posted a video saying, hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Agarwal. Welcome. My name is Dr. Agarwal. My pronouns are she, her. My one of my favorite TV shows is Jane the Virgin. I'll see you soon. And then my students have already started responding and posting their own videos. And I can reply to their videos. You can set it to reply with written comments. I prefer for everyone to reply with a video. Um, and so I then, when I have time, like 24 hours before my first class, I reply to any of the students or some of the students so they can see what that looks like. So it's fun. I think it's engaging. I model it without just expecting my students to do it. Um, for students who are very nervous about it, I do mention that they can just kind of cover up the camera on their laptop. There's a free phone app. So they can cover the camera if they're nervous about it. I do make the blanket statement of like, please be appropriate <laughs> without having to go into what that means, but you know, please be appropriate. Um, so those are the basic ground rules. And then logistically, you can set the video limits from maybe 10 seconds to three minutes. Uh, and so I typically have them anywhere from 30 seconds to a minute long, which I find doable for me on double speed and grading. Students find that comfortable and doable as well. Um, in term, I see the question, thank you, about issues with signing on. I have had this issue as well. Because I just did this like yesterday, <laughs> they seem to have updated the website. So there's now an option under settings where anyone can uh join the group when they have the link i think it's still set where students have to enter in an email address to sign up so if you just go to the flipgrid link thank you if you go to the flipgrid link students are given the option join with microsoft or join with google and we're a, a google classroom school uh, and so my students do still have to log in with their google email addresses there's also an option where you can copy and paste student emails, and that's how students can gain access. I do occasionally have students who have issues, so then I will manually go in and add their email. Make sure that students are not creating a login at admin.flipgrid.com. That's for us. That's the back end, and sometimes my students end up at admin.flipgrid.com and I'm not sure how um, but yeah make sure they are using their email address uh, and you can specify like a at colin.edu um, or you can add email addresses manually and I think this new feature anyone with the link can join I hope helps with that too they do have amazing customer service I swear they don't pay me for these plugs um, if you just tweet at them or send them a, a direct message on Twitter they get back really, really fast, and they seem to have a really engaged community. It seems more common in K-12, but I am so excited to see it being used more in higher ed. I have a uh, colleague at another university uh, who is a music professor, and she uses Flipgrid all the time, and she loves it, and her students love it too, so. Um. Okay, we have another question um, that's a little more discipline specific. Uh, wondering if you could suggest some specifically uh, metacognitive activities specific to writing situations or writing activities. We have a lot of faculty members here who teach writing um, or incorporate writing in their courses. Um, I love that question, and honestly, I'm not sure if there's much research on metacognition specifically for writing disciplines or writing classes. Um, so I'm just 
thinking through anecdotally, and I would love for people to type into the chat if you have ideas as well. Please make this interactive. Um, I mean, I think the first thing that comes to mind is the simple, how confident are you that your essay or paper hit all of the class requirements? Or how, uh, maybe that, how confident are you that you, yeah, really nailed this assignment or not sure? How confident are you that you understand when to use M dashes versus N dashes? Um, if you, how um, are you feeling sort of even in advance? How do you feel about what you've learned in this class this semester so far? Um, so I think it's helpful to start ideally with a retrieval prompt, like what did you learn this semester so far? And then how are you feeling about that? Are you like totally sure you learned all those things? Are you surprised that you forgot a little bit? The writing process in and of itself, of course, is retrieval. Students learn a writing technique, then they are implementing it in their writing, and then the metacognitive step is how well do you think you implemented that? How well do you think you understand that technique? So I think there's still opportunities even for humanities and language arts classes. Understandably, it might seem a little more simple for like biology or chemistry, math, history, science. Um, but I think even for writing and literature is an opportunity for us to ask students, what do you think about your own learning in addition to just simply having them write? Thanks for that. Um, well, we have about five minutes left in our allotted time. So um, I figured now might be a good time to open up the floor to additional questions from those of you who are here today. So um, what additional questions do you have that, that we haven't addressed yet during our conversation today? Here's your chance. So we have one from Alex, who is a, a music faculty member here at the college, asking about how the Berkeley music faculty have adopted some of these concepts in teaching music. Yeah, thank you. Um, so again, in case you missed Dr. Uh, Boyer's introduction, I teach psychology and neuroscience at the Berkeley College of Music in Boston. So I teach psychology and neuroscience to musicians um, who predominantly have music related classes. And one of the key um, techniques that a lot of music faculty have adopted is the strategy of interleaving that I talked very briefly about in my keynote, um, where it's the simple idea of just mixing things up, of, of a very specific mm, project assignment concept. So mixing up the order in which a student plays a song, mixing up the order in which students are learning lyrics or dance choreography, uh, because oftentimes students and music faculty just kind of go start to finish with like rehearsals, for example, going start to finish. And we know from research and probably from your own experience, you remember the beginning of things and the end of things, but not the middle. So even for faculty giving private instruction, they kind of hop around a little bit like, oh, let's practice the technique you learned about last week. That's retrieval practice, kind of peppered in with doing exercises in order and out of order. Another example is, let's say, students are learning addition problems and subtraction problems. And it's, it's what we call blocking. If students are only learning addition, then they know to switch to only subtraction. Interleaving is mixing those up. So a student's kind of on their toes, not in a gotcha way, but like a, oh, is this word problem addition or subtraction? So with music, because students are already retrieving, they're practicing, they're playing their instruments, that's all retrieval. Interleaving is one of the keys that's coming up um, that I'm noticing with music faculty. Any other questions for Dr. Agarwal while we have her here? While we're waiting for other questions, um, I will say your example of learning a song in different orders um, was kind of an aha moment for me in particular. I used to be, I was in a choir before I moved here and our director used to do that all the time. 
And um, it wasn't until your talk that I went, oh, that's why he's doing that. So thank you for that. Uh, any other questions before we uh, release Dr. Agarwal? There is one in the chat. Uh, is it okay to teach strategies to remember simultaneously as celebrating forgetting so that when they will be called upon to have learned the information, perhaps in performance, they will not rely entirely on forgetting as a good. Yes, so I can see how maybe celebrating forgetting could almost <laughs> imply that you should definitely forget, <laughs> um, where entirely forgetting is not good. Um, another, maybe along those same lines, one way I put it to students, we have conversations about forgetting. At the same time, I want them to remember stuff. I want them to remember something. All of our students are paying tuition. All of our students are coming to class. All of our students are pouring a lot of time, energy, and money at Collin College, at the Berkeley College of Music, and I want them to remember something. The way I pose it is, otherwise, what's the point of this class? What's the point of the entire 15-week semester if you can't remember your own stuff, your own learning course concepts, etc., that are important to you? So I acknowledge you're going to forget a lot of stuff from this class, but especially with more retrieval practice, facing and leaving feedback with those evidence-based strategies, you're going to remember more as well. You'll be more aware of your forgetting, but you're going to remember more. So I think, I wonder if coming back to that question, it kind of depends on how you have those conversations. I think I highlight forgetting is okay, Remembering is what we really want. Yeah, thanks. All right, we um, are past our allotted time at this point. Um, I think we have had a really rich discussion um, and it was really nice to be able to have a deep dive into some of these concepts with you uh, in this kind of intimate conversation. So thank you so much for uh, being willing to do this with us here today. And thank you for your, uh, your expertise and your great presentation. Um, and uh, I want to encourage everybody who's here, again, if you haven't done it yet, please watch uh, the recording that Dr. Agarwal provided for us. Um, for part one of the keynote, there's some really excellent uh, strategies and resources that she shares there and on her website. Um, I did one more question that I have for you. Um, how long will your video be available to our faculty? As long as you want. Yay, <laughs> so as long as you go to retrievalpractice.org slash Colin is probably the easiest way to get to it. The very first button says watch the keynote and you can click on that to go straight to YouTube. Um, otherwise, the link that you shared, Dr. Boyer, should work indefinitely as well. Yeah. Awesome. And, and I just love to say thank you to all of you who are here watching this recording. We all start classes in five days. <laughs> so I'm quite excited that you're taking this time to be here and, um, you know, not asking you to throw the baby out with the bathwater, but even just like the smallest retrieval opportunity will help all of our students. So thank you so much for your time and attention today too. And thank you again to Colin College for inviting me. This is fantastic. Awesome. Thank you so much. This has been so fun and so enjoyable. Um, and uh, I look forward to uh, reading more of your work and um, hopefully hearing from you again. So thank you so much. Good luck to you and good luck to everybody on the start of classes next week. Enjoy the three-day weekend while you can. <laughs> Thank you, everybody.